Hi, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of The Negotiation. On today's episode, we talk with Dr. Julie Klinger, Professor of Geography and Special Sciences at the University of Delaware, where she's also a part of the Faculty of Minerals, Materials, and Society. This episode is all about the industry of rare earth metals or rare earth elements, an industry that China dominates and every piece of technology relies on, from magnets to rockets. We talk about how the industry has evolved over the last 30 years, the fact that they aren't actually rare at all, and why, if every country has them in some abundance, we don't all mine our own. We also uncover a fascinating narrative in that the world of rare earth elements and metals is catalyzing a change to the decades-old governing rationale behind global supply chains, where cheapest labor and least amount of environmental regulation always wins. This is a really interesting and unique episode about an industry that impacts our lives daily that nobody knows about, that China currently dominates as a producer, and why they would actually like to give up that number one spot. Enjoy. Avatar (laughs) had just come out. And at the time, it was, you know, the highest grossing, grossing film of all time. So everyone had seen, everyone was familiar with this story of like these, this thing called unobtainium, which is essential to, you know, modern life as we know it. And I think, you know, folks were just ready for a sort of sensational story in which China could somehow leverage rare earth elements to control the rest of the world. Home to over 4 billion people, the Asia-Pacific region boasts one of the most powerful consumer markets on the planet. Not only is it home to half the world's under 30 population, but it's also home to more than half the world's internet users. It's a market no globally minded brand should ignore, but entering markets like China is no easy task. Just ask the likes of Microsoft, Google, Uber, and Facebook. Times are changing, and with the right partners, doors are slowly opening as more and more companies find success expanding into the markets of the Middle Kingdom. I myself spent eight years in China, mostly as a venture capitalist, helping early-stage tech companies enter the Asia-Pacific market successfully. This show is dedicated to uncovering and examining successful China entry and growth strategies by interviewing the people behind those success stories. My name is Todd Embley, and welcome to The Negotiation, brought to you by WPIC Marketing and Technologies. Dr. Julie Klinger, thanks for coming on the show today. Ah, Thanks for having me, Todd. To kick off the show, would you mind giving our listeners an introduction to rare earth metals? What are they, where are they used, and where are they primarily mined? All right. Excellent question. Well, the first thing I will say about rare earth metals is that, for the most part, they're actually not rare. Most rare earth elements are as common as copper or lead as far as their occurrence in the earth's crust. And the good news is um, the rarest ones we actually have developed the fewest amount of applications for. Um, So that's the... That's the disclaimer uh, right off the bat. Rare earth metals are not actually rare. Um, But what are they? They, The term refers to a family of elements that are located in, you know, if you can picture the periodic table in your mind, there's that island to the south. Um, The rare earth elements refers to the lanthanide series, which is the top bar of that island. Um, elements uh, 57 to 71, and then scandium and yttrium are also often included in the family. Um, Now, rare earths are, each element is distinct and unique, but the thing that they all have in common are these fantastic magnetic and conductive properties, you know, which is why they're so important for so many of the technologies that we use today. Um, They tend to be used in all different kinds of technologies. I mean, of course, in information and communications technology, any kind of energy um, generation technology, whether we're talking about fossil fuels, nuclear, or renewable energy, requires rare earth elements. Uh, Your surgical devices, um, your spaceships, your satellites, um, and even your pipelines and uh, bridges and that sort of thing will also use rare earth elements. Um, A fun fact um, is that some of them also have some very nice colors. So for example, uh, the element cerium Um, has a sort of lovely pink color when it's added to glass. So if any of you have any antique glassware uh, from your grandma's collection or what have you, that's probably cerium. 
And that is the very same element that is used as a signal booster in transoceanic fiber optic cables, which enables uh, global internet communications. Now, the thing about rare earths is that although they are not at all rare on earth, um, they are only mined in a few places. Uh, China, of course, um, has been the primary source of rare earth elements worldwide. Uh, it's a role that it increasingly assumed through the 80s, uh, really consolidated in the 90s. And then, um, you know, with the closure of the Mountain Pass Mine in Southern California in 2000, uh, became essentially a de facto monopoly after the turn of the millennium. Um, now, the reason that China is mining most of the most rare earth elements that are consumed globally is not because China possesses the greatest quantity of rare earth deposits. This is a very common misconception. Um, instead, it's because, um, you know, unfortunately, the story of uh, global industrial change um, over the latter, latter part of the 20th century in the rare earth industry is not entirely different from other sectors of the economy where, look, I mean, mining and processing rare earth elements uh, is dangerous. It is chemical and energy intensive um, and it is environmentally hazardous. And so, um, you know, for these and several other reasons, production concentrated in China um, over the past 35 to 40 years. Now, just about every country on earth has sufficient rare earth deposits um, that could in theory be mined. Uh, so the question there is, you know, why don't they? And the answer to that simply is that it is expensive to do safely and well. Um, the geological conditions under which rare earth deposits coalesce um, happen to be the exact same conditions under which mineable deposits of radioactive materials like thorium and radium, uh, thorium and uranium uh, also consolidate. So quite often, if you find a really nice mineable deposit of rare earth elements, you're also probably looking at a nice concentration of radioactive elements too. And um, unfortunately, you can't just dig up the stuff you want. You have to dig up um, a whole bunch of other stuff too. And so quite often, rare earth mining creates a radioactive waste management situation. How has the global demand for rare earth metals changed over the last 30 years? Oh, that's a really interesting question. Uh, because rare earth elements are essential for the hardware and software of contemporary life, you know, as are um, energy communications, uh, military, scientific, and medical technologies have changed over the years. Uh, the same can be said for um, our, global, our global demand for rare earth elements. Of course, rare earth elements are essential to any renewable energy transition uh, that we would hope to bring about. They're also really important for um, you know, making complex scientific and medical instrumentation smaller and more portable. You know, so any sort of development or sustainable development oriented outcome that, that we would like to see does require technologies that contain rare earth elements. Now, the thing is, that can uh, paint a picture of, you know, oh my gosh, we're going to have just this incredible spike in global demand and uh, we aren't going to have enough production to meet that, to meet that need. Um, but in fact, you know, rare earths are, tend not to be the primary commodity of which, you know, any of these technologies are composed. So, you know, a metaphor or um, uh, that I like to use is actually, you know, think about, think about your laptop or think about, you know, think about your uh, fossil fuel refinery as like, a, you know, a batch of cookies or a cake or something. Um, the rare earths are not, say, the primary ingredient. Um, if you like to bake, um, you'll know that you'll use things like baking soda or baking powder very sparingly. Um, those are very important, though. And so you might think about the way we use rare earth elements the same way. You use just a little bit um, in order to make technologies lighter or stronger or faster. 
Um, this is why, for, for example, in China, uh, rare earths are, rec are, call, are referred to as, I believe it's, like, it, it's Gong Ye de Wei Jing. <laughs> it's the MSG of industry. It's that little extra something that makes your um, products that much better. Is it possible for us to exhaust our supply of rare earth metals on this planet? Planetarily, no. Um, it is so, so unlikely that we will exhaust the supplies of rare earth elements, you know, based on known uh, mineable deposits that are cataloged to exist within the Earth's crust, that it doesn't even warrant a serious projection. Like, um, like you might see, you know, for petroleum or gold or other sorts of things like that. Uh, you know, even with the dramatic proliferation of all different kinds of rare earth bearing technologies and materials over the past 30 years, you know, global demand is, it's somewhere between, you know, on the low end, 120,000 tons annually to on the high end, be 160, 170,000 tons. I mean, that's, two orders of magnitude less than our, say, our annual global consumption of iron. Wow, that's incredible. But, and here I thought they were supposed to be rare. <laughs> so when uh, the, the elements or what looked like maybe could be new elements were first identified in the late 1700s in Sweden, um, no one had ever seen them before, and so they were thought to be rare. And the name has stuck. Um, in my research, the first sort of official scientific complaint that rare earth elements were in fact a misnomer uh, comes from 1907. <laughs> and so, you know, the chemists, the materials scientists, the engineers, the folks who work with these materials to build all of the really great and important stuff that, you know, contemporary life and society and economy depends on, they tend not to talk about rare earth elements amongst themselves. They tend, you know, if they're working on working with rare earth elements, they're working with neodymium specifically, or europium, or cerium. Um, but I think that, you know, the name persists because honestly, it's kind of sexy. You know, people get much more excited about something called rare earth, right? As opposed to something called, I don't know, dysprosium. You mentioned China before, and I want to bring it back to that because of course we are an APAC focused podcast. How does China factor into this rare earth metals, rare earth elements world? Mm. So China has such a fascinating role in the evolution of, you know, rare earth research development and applications globally. Um, you know, I would, I would divide um, China's role in the rare earth metals world into roughly three phases. Um, you know, the first one is, you know, the height of the Cold War. Um, you know, we're talking 1950s, China, Soviet Union, uh, cooperating to build up mining and industrial bases and just pumping lots of research into, um, into the development of rare earth bearing alloys and all of that. Um, you know, that's the first phase. It lasts from, you know, pretty shortly after uh, the PRC was established. Um, I think it was, you know, January of 1950 when uh, the leadership of China and the former Soviet Union uh, got together to actually plan to develop a comprehensive mining research and development base in Inner Mongolia and Baotou. Um, of course, you know, the two countries had a falling out <laughs> in the late 1950s, um, but not before uh, the Soviet Union had provided um, really extensive and comprehensive uh, technical support and uh, planning expertise and scientific training to Chinese counterparts um, so that those folks who had received training could effectively carry forward, you know, the sort of broad national mandate to build up um, comprehensive rare earths, uh, mining, refining, and um, research and development industry going forward. Um, and so, you know, during the Cold War, um, up until, you know, Deng Xiaoping's 1978 reforms, the focus in China was really on, you know, developing alloys to make rockets, to make 
uh, nuclear weapons, to make, you know, intercontinental, intercontinental ballistic missiles, but also to make, you know, uh, iron and steel alloys so you could build really strong bridges, you know, that wouldn't collapse, um, you know, things like that. Um, and then the second phase, it was really post-1978 with Deng Xiaoping's reform, you know, where, um, you know, Deng Xiaoping basically you know, in the late, late 70s, early 1980s, embarked on several world tours asking um, other countries and economies to relocate um, their industries to China, um, you know, and because China was interested in technology transfer and interested, of course, in, you know, mobilizing its immense labor base. Um, and, you know, this is when you started to see uh, the piecemeal transfer of rare earth mining and uh, refining steps to China, um, beginning in the 80s and then really picking up steam in the 1990s. Um, and, you know, this was actually a time of complementary interests. I mean, firms located in the Western world uh, we're looking to export some of the dirtiest and most dangerous steps in, um, in rare earth uh, processing and beneficiation. And so, you know, like what they would do, for example, you have a mine in Southern California. They dig the stuff up. They uh, put it through a sort of basic separations process. They load up a bunch of shipping containers with minimally processed ores, send them to Tianjin, you know, then in Tianjin, they get placed on placed on a train and they go out to Inner Mongolia where they get processed into high purity, uh, high purity oxides and then turned into, you know, electrical components or magnets or things like that. That really characterized the development of China's industry, um, you know, in the, in the last 20 years of the 20th century. And then from the mid 2000s onward, you know, starting in about 2003, 2004, the central government started to limit, they started to impose quotas on the export of, you know, uh, rare earth oxides, the minimally refined stuff, because, um, you know, this is something that's really gotten a lot more attention in re recent years under Xi Jinping's administration. But from the mid 2000s onward, um, China's central government focus for the rare earth industry was, look, let's get ourselves off the bottom rung of, you know, the ladder of production here and focus on value added processing and uh, shifting actually from uh, exporting primary stuff to actually importing stuff from other parts of the world. Um, and so this is what you see happening in China now. So phase one, Cold War, uh, you know, nuclear weapons, ICBMs, communist industry, all of that stuff, phase two, um, let's have the world's, the world's industry move to China, um, part of building up China as the industrial platform for the world. And then phase three is, okay, let's focus on value-added processing and cleaning up the environmental aspect of things. How many people do you think the rare earth metals industry employs in the PRC? Wow. You know, I could give you a couple of ballpark estimates. And my fear is that they would be wildly inaccurate. But let me tell you what the basis of those estimates would be. So China's rare earth industry um, is currently consolidated under, you know, what's called the big six, right? These are six major firms that, um, you know, are largely vertically integrated. They're, each of them are centered around major sites of extraction. And, you know, so you have thousands of people involved in these large scale mining operations. You have hundreds of people involved in uh, the local and regional transport. And then you have thousands of people involved in the basic refining, right? And that's just the first three steps of the commodity chain. Um, and I'm talking about you know, these, these figures that I just gave you for, you know, the thousands in mining, the hundreds in transport and the thousands in refining and processing that's in each of the major big six sites, you know, that are sort of located in different parts of China, mainly in Northern, mainly in Western China, um, but not exclusively. And then you have all of the value added industries, right? You have the 
uh, the, the magnet producers. You have the people who contract with the magnet producers to produce, um, you know, wind turbines. And then you have the people who are producing, um, you know, uh, components for bridges and pipelines and things like that. I mean, um, easily hundreds of thousands of people are involved. And part of that is due to the nature of the rare earth commodity chain. I mean, when we're talking about rare earths, we're talking about 17 separate elements. You know, so we're talking about things as diverse as like cheap novelty sunglasses that are pink or green, <laughs> which use rare earth elements to uh, flat screen TVs, to energy efficient lighting fixtures, to, you know, nuclear submarines. <laughs> Okay, I want to talk a little bit more about policy. As you mentioned, China is looking to get off the bottom rung here. Xi Jinping obviously paying much more attention to the rare earth metals industry. How much would you say policy has changed in China over the last 30 years? And would you say that it has even changed a lot over the last 10 since China has come into their own as an economic powerhouse? Yes. Absolutely. Short answer to the last question there is, yes, it's changed significantly in the last decade. But let's get into it. If you are looking up information on China's rare earth industry, and you are doing an English language internet search, uh, the narrative you will find is, you know, 2010, China imposes export quotas. This drives the price up thousands of percents in, in some cases. And then 2014, uh, China loses a WTO case, and so it has to remove its export quotas, and so the prices come back down. And then, you know, the story kind of unfolds from there. It's basically China's central government is controlling the industry, and the rest of the world that's trying to play according to free market rules is losing. Right? That's the conventional narrative. Here is what the conventional narrative gets wrong. The export quotas were old news in 2010. In fact, the first export quotas you know, were announced, I believe, in 1999, and they went into effect in, in 2000, right? And so if you read an English language source on um, you know, China's rare earth industry, and if they include a, a graph of you know, the export quotas, most of them start in 2010, kind of conveniently cutting off the whole prior decade in which, you know, in fact, the export quotas were much more stringent in the first part of the 2000s uh, than they were, you know, in 2009 and 2010 and afterwards. Um, but the thing is, nobody really cared, <laughs> for lack of a better term, because, you know, the, uh, the rest of the world was perfectly content to rely on China for rare earth elements and rare earth bearing technological components. It wasn't until something completely unrelated to rare earths happened, um, you know, which was you know, the 2010 uh, dispute between Japan and China over the Diaoyu or Senkaku Islands, that all of a sudden rare earths kind of exploded. Um, into the popular consciousness, and all of a sudden, China became a nefarious actor. Even though actually not much had changed from an industry standpoint or from a policy standpoint. But I actually want to take a little bit to talk about what happened in 2010, because it's kind of become fossilized, like a, the a fiction of what has happened has become, you know, the mm -hmm. sort of common sense in the Western world. Mm -hmm. So here's what happens. Uh, you know, mid 2010, uh, you know, China and Japan are um, disputing these islands, and the dispute over these islands is getting a little bit more public, right? Um, now, the dispute, the dispute over these islands um, is something that's been going on for decades. And the standard operating procedure is basically, you know, the Japanese and Chinese coast guards uh, have a working arrangement whereby both of them will kind of patrol a perimeter around the islands and prevent anyone from getting within, you know, 12 nautical kilometers. So, you know, that's kind of standard operating procedure that allows fisher people from China and Japan to do their thing. Um, and it also allows both sides to have a degree of assurance that nobody's, you know, going to try and 
plant a flag on the islands, I guess, sneak in and claim it. And, you know, in 2010, these, uh, the fact that, you know, Japan was not recognizing China's claim over these islands was something that was all over the press in China and people were getting riled up about it. And there was this one fisherman, uh, John Chishong, got a little inebriated and decided to go claim the islands for China himself. And so he drove his fishing belt, uh, his fishing boat within this 12 nautical kilometer buffer zone. And the Japanese Coast Guard happened to be <laughs> happened to be patrolling at the time. And, you know, they did all the routine signals, please leave, please turn around. We're going to escort you now. And instead of complying with the escort, he rammed his fishing boat into a Japanese Coast Guard vessel and was taken into custody. And so this, of course, uh, was interpreted in, in Eastern China, particularly as, you know, an act of unilateral escalation on the part of Japan. Meanwhile, China's Ministry of Foreign Affairs um, was working to secure the safe release and transfer back to China, to the repatriation of Jiang Shishong. And, you know, folks in China were getting really impatient about this um, because nothing that happens between China and Japan is neutral because of the histories and memories around World War II. And so what happened is, you know, some uh, military officials and port workers in one port in eastern China decided to just kind of teach Japan some humility, so to speak, uh, by upholding some shipments you know, some loaded cargo ships that were destined for Japan. And, you know, they didn't say we're holding these hostage until you release Jiang Qishong. They said, oh, no, uh, we need to make sure that these exports comply with all of our regulations. <laughs> right. So it was a sort of a bureaucratic maneuver to slow down some slow down some exports. And the hope would be that it would remind Japan of its dependence on China. This wasn't anything that was mandated from Beijing. These were people taking matters into their own hands. And in fact, no one in Beijing really knew about this until the Japanese Customs Authority inquired uh, with the Chinese Customs Authority, you know, hey, where are these missing shipments? And then the story got out that, you know, uh, these shipments happen to contain something called rare earth elements. And then the New York Times broke a story with a headline that China embargoed rare earth elements to Japan. Now, words really matter because an embargo is an official halt of exports or trade during wartime, right? So this is a, it's an official act that occurs during a time of war. This was an unofficial act uh, mm -hmm. that occurred during peacetime. <laughs> Right. But that's become the narrative. And in fact, I think the Western imagination was kind of primed for something like this, such that, you know, even if you show the export receipts or the import receipts, you know, from either China or Japan side of things, uh, what you actually see is a very modest disruption, a very modest and temporary disruption in exports. But because the word was that China embargoed rare earths to Japan, the markets reacted. You know, there was just this panic because people had to learn very quickly, okay, okay, what are rare earth elements? Oh my goodness, China uh, controls, you know, the production of 97% of these things and they're essential for every piece of technology that's around us. Oh my goodness, right? So people jumped to conclusions there's a lot of sloppy logic involved, you know, including, well, the assumption that, you know, if China mines most of these things, it must be because China has most of these things. And so, of course, you know, uh, the price for these things went through the roof because everyone just assumed that it was doomsday and China had us all in a stranglehold and there was nothing we could do. And so I would say it was the mischaracterization of this whole thing as an embargo and the market reaction to it that created the scarcity, the temporary but very real scarcity that downstream firms experienced in the latter part of 2010. And this is where I assume that misnomer of rare is playing a big part in it as well. Oh, absolutely. And let's remember, this is, this is 2010, you know, Avatar <laughs> had just come out. And at the time it was 
you know, the highest grossing, grossing film of all time. So everyone had seen, everyone was familiar with this story of like these, this thing called unobtainium, which is essential to, you know, modern life as we know it. And I think, you know, folks were just ready for a sort of sensational story in which China could somehow leverage rare earth elements to control the rest of the world. The fact is, I mean, I also don't want to play, you know, the very real and serious effects of structural scarcity. But the fact is, any sort of scarcity that the rest of the world experiences is simply a result of, you know, the rest of the world's failure to get rare earth operations up and running outside of China, right? We, of course, since 2010, it was a really important wake up call. We've seen initiatives in Australia, in the US, in Canada. Um, there's initiatives in Brazil, Argentina, Chile, Russia as well, uh, where folks are working on sort of re-diversifying uh, the global supply chain for rare earth elements. Can you quickly discern between rare earth elements and rare earth metals for our listeners? We've been using them both somewhat interchangeably, and I'm not sure that's exactly correct. Oh, yeah. So, um you know, generally rare earth metals and rare earth elements, the terms are used interchangeably uh, because for the most part, when people are talking about rare earth elements, they're talking about um, the most commonly used and important ones like uh, neodymium and dysprosium. You know, these are the elements that are used to make magnets, right? These are, these are metals. But the entire family of rare earth elements includes includes things that aren't metals, right? So they, that means they have um, a different chemical composition. So an example of a rare earth element that isn't a metal would be something like praseodymium or promethium. They just have a different chemical composition. But yeah, for the most part, for conventional usage, it's okay to use the two interchangeably. Given the fact that China has the world's largest deposits of rare earth elements, does the country feel any need to look outside its borders to continue to grow its perceived control of the trade? What would that do to the rest of the world, including consumers and even more so manufacturers? That's a really important question. And I think when when people are you know, trying to learn more about the global rare earth situation, this is really the concern that's at the front of their minds. Um, I mean, it's the concern that's, you know, driving a uh, number of private firms to figure out how to mine these things in outer space, <laughs> for example. The first thing to clarify is that while it is true that China produces most of the rare earth elements that are consumed globally, it's not because China has the largest deposits. Um, there was a time at which that was thought to be the case, but, you know, you can take a look at, you know, check out the uh, United States Geological Survey um, or look up any number of published maps of, you know, mineable rare earth deposits and you'll find over a thousand spread across, across the globe. Um, and that doesn't even include, you know, the deposits that are being identified, you know, at the bottom of the ocean and things like that. But, you know, this question, you know, does the country feel any need to look outside its border to continue to grow its control of the trade? Um, that is actually a very important question. So every couple of years, China's central government publishes a white paper, which, which, is, which is effectively a policy position paper meant to provide guidance to all the relevant public and private sector actors uh, within China to reformulate their strategies according to, you know, the national vision. And the national vision for rare earth elements is this. Uh, China, rare earth elements are essential um, in order for China to uh, grow its, you know, positive made in China brand. So what uh, the Chinese government has been doing, for example, you know, along with um, its sort of uh, along with its various initiatives associated with the Belt and Road um, or with, you know, bilateral or multilateral aid is, you know, China um, is often sending geologists um, out to visit uh, countries, say, in Central Asia, Southeast Asia, or Africa, um, to help those governments identify their uh, potentially mineable rare earth element deposits. 
right? And so you can see how this fits within the framework of win-win, right? A lot of countries are eager to emulate China's rapid development and, you know, widespread resource exploitation and heavy industrialization was a key part of that, uh, that program. Um, and for China's part, you know, uh, ever since the early 2000s, the goal has been for China to become a net importer of minimally produced rare earth elements. That means that um, China's central government would prefer that other parts of the world uh, assume a greater share of the burden of mining and processing these things. And so what we are seeing is a restructuring of the global rare earth supply chain whereby you have new sources of rare earth elements opening up around the world um, and those minimally processed ores are uh, or even you know further beneficiated ores are then being shipped to china for value-added processing right to produce the magnets and the technological components or maybe even the finished products to then export to the rest of the world, right? So uh, this is a pretty radical reconfiguration of you know, the global division of labor from say that which consolidated around uh, North American markets as um, exporters of you know, uh, high value technologies and that sort of thing in the, in the latter part of the 20th century. And so here's what that means for the rest of the world. You know, if the rest of the world, or particularly those of us in uh, North America, don't focus on repatriating our uh, high technology supply chains, uh, we could be looking at, at a world where, you know, look, China doesn't just have a de facto monopoly over the raw materials. They also have a de facto monopoly over many of our most important information, communication, medical, and scientific technologies. And in fact, in many sectors, this is already the case. I mean, for example, the US Department of Defense um, periodically comes under, under fire, <laughs> you know, because you know, some supply chains for you know, jet fighters and other weapon systems are entirely dependent on China. Right? And it's been that way for um, a couple of decades. And from you know, a US federal government standpoint, that is the most efficient, low cost solution. Right? So what does this mean for the rest of the world, including consumers? I think you know, for the most part, consumers are largely unaffected by this. I mean, we are, we've been witnessing a really radical transformation in uh, China's supply chains over the past 10 years. And for the most part, you know, end, use, end users um, haven't seen that big of a change, except for maybe there be more stuff, <laughs> um, more fancy technologies to buy, right? But, you know, we're in a really interesting moment right now, particularly, you know, in, in the midst of the, uh, you know, COVID-19 pandemic, where, you know, it's actually provoking some long overdue conversations around what actually should be the governing rationale for our global supply chains. You know, we've been operating in a context, you know, defined by the last four or five decades where the governing rationale is, okay, uh, who's got the cheapest labor and, you know, the, the least amount of environmental regulations? Okay, let's reorganize our global supply chains that way because it maximizes profits. And the result is, look, we've had a lot of really great um, commodities and, you know, the influx of cheap Chinese goods, particularly to the Western world, has cushioned consumers against the effects of inflation for a number of years. But on the other hand, you know, quantity, we all know that quantity and quality are two very different things. And so we might be, this might be a key moment for us to think strategically about how to re-regionalize our global commodity chains, particularly around, you know, critical elements like rare earths and other technology metals that are really important for you know, just about every sort of technology that you can imagine. What would you say is the average Chinese citizen's awareness of rare earth element mining and China's position in that space? How would you say they feel about it? Are they concerned about any of the negative impacts? 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Chinese citizen awareness of, uh, you know, rare earth elements and China's position in all of this, it really spans the gamut. So I've got uh, two short stories that kind of illustrate the diversity of perspectives within China. So one is, you know, when I first went to uh, Inner Mongolia for the very first time, you know, in 2010, uh, I visited, you know, the the Inner Mongolia Autonomous Region Museum, and they had a whole room dedicated to rare earth elements. I was walking around looking at the exhibits, and um, there was this display of, you know, refined rare earth oxides, and I walked up behind a grandfather and a grandson looking at these things. And this was a moment that I mean, it just, you couldn't script <laughs> a more interesting, iconic moment. This was in 2010. And the grandson asks the grandfather, what are these things? And the grandfather says, these are rare earth elements. They're really important for China. And Japan wants to take all of them from us. <laughs> so this is in 2010. And you can already see there how the narrative has morphed, right? How this thing took on a life of its own um, within the context of the tensions over the Diaoyu Islands or Senkaku yeah. Islands. Yeah. I do think in general that, you know, the general sense of rare earth elements in China among, you know, your sort of educated urban reader of newspapers is that they're very important, that, that the fact that China dominates um, global production is a point of pride. And, you know, if you get into the university space or particularly in the uh, entrepreneurial and innovation space, um, you know, the, the simple fact is, is that as far as research and development goes, uh, China's outpaced the rest of the world for over a decade even if you're just measuring in terms of patents filed um, for rare earth applications. And so it's a point of pride. What are some of the second order effects of China's policy towards rare earth elements that perhaps don't immediately come to mind? Well, okay, so China's overall policy toward rare earth elements consists of consolidating and cleaning up uh, its, its industries domestically while also maintaining a steady flow of raw materials to keep those industries going, which means that uh, Chinese firms are investing in uh, rare earth mining and processing operations overseas. And also uh, China's government is uh, supporting efforts of other governments, particularly partner or strategic partner governments to develop rare earth mining operations on their own soil. So, you know, some, there's some interesting second order effects here. Um, and they, they break down kind of between what are the second order effects in China and what are the second order effects internationally. Within China, um, the fact that there has been this massive effort to consolidate and clean up, um, you know, the domestic rare earth industry to uh, close down informal and unsafe uh, mining operations is a victory for Chinese environmentalists. Like that's really good news, actually, for people who have been fighting for years or decades uh, to get their backyards cleaned up. Um, that's really good news. Uh, the other bigger picture side of that is, look, okay, so if this pollution isn't happening in China, where is it happening? And um, unfortunately, one of the things that we might be witnessing is, you know, as China's cleaning up domestically, um, it's exporting um, the more dangerous and polluting parts of the industry to other parts of the world. Um, you know, within uh, China's development, sort of China's official development doctrine, this is just something you have to do to develop. You know, you get dirty first and then you clean up later. And, you know, experts point to Britain and the Industrial Revolution. They point to the United States, you know, and, uh, you know, the, the river that caught on fire in Ohio in the 1960s. And then all of a sudden you had the Clean Air Act and the EPA and all of that. Um, and they say, look, like, this is just what you have to do. Um, but I think, um, you know, some second order effects that don't immediately come to mind um, actually concern the really considerable know-how that um, 
that has developed in China in terms of actually how do you clean up a super toxic mining hellscape? How do you actually do that? It turns out people have been working on that in China. And so um, that means two things. That means one, um, rare earth mining doesn't necessarily have to be totally devastating. That you know, globally we have the scientific and engineering know-how to do it in environmentally responsible manner. And two, you know, for those mining sites, rare earth or otherwise, that are just this chronic, awful environmental and public health problem. Um, there's actually expertise there. Like there's an opportunity for partnerships, you know, with Chinese. Uh, scientists and engineers to maybe clean up our own backyards too, where we do have these problems. Where do you predict the rare earth element industry in China is going to go in the next 20 years? How will consumers both inside and outside China be impacted? Because at the end of the day, we all use technology and devices that contain rare earth elements. Hmm. Well, there is the business as usual scenario, and then there's the the rest of us got our act together scenario. <laughs> so I generally try to refrain, refrain from predictions. Um, I try to stick with what is empirical and verifiable. But here we go. Uh, the business as usual prediction is that the global rare earth supply chain will reconsolidate around China with China as um, a, if that, not the major uh, value-added producer of uh, just about every bit of energy, information, medical, and scientific technology uh, that we depend on, even more so than it is today. Uh, that's the business-as-usual scenario. The we-get-our-act-together scenario is actually one in which we see a uh, sort of re-regionalization of global rare earth supply chains where, look, okay, so maybe we have a couple of, you know, environmentally, environmentally safe uh, rare earth mining operations throughout the Americas. And maybe we're not just sending that minimally processed material to China. Maybe we're building up our vertically integrated technology and energy and information and communications <laughs> supply chains um, within the Americas, right? Business as usual scenario is we all become the primary commodity exporters that are exporting rares to China and buying finished technologies from China, which creates a trade deficit, an even bigger one than we already have. And in, we get a, in the we get our acts together scenario, uh, we actually... Uh, think a little bit more seriously about uh, what we'd like our global supply chains to look like. And we reinvest in the manufacturing and research and industrial capacity in the West. And, you know, the big question is how will either of these scenarios impact uh, consumers? I think we'll see under business as usual, we'll see a continuation of the current trends where consumer debt um, in the West uh, continues to increase right? As um, the really good, well-paying jobs um, in the value-added industries had, had elsewhere. And so people rely on debt to purchase their finished goods that are imported from China. Or the we get our act together scenario involves uh, creating all sorts of wonderful new green jobs in, you know, the sort of re repatriated, re-regionalized uh, rare supply chain in the Americas. Um, I think in either scenario, uh, we'll see, we won't really see significant disruptions in the flows of goods and technologies, uh, barring any sort of wildly catastrophic, unforeseen scenario such as a global pandemic. <laughs> well, on that note, Dr. Julie Klinger, thank you very much for being on our show today. We really enjoyed having you as our guest. All right. I had a great time. Good luck. Growing a company is hard. Doing it in a foreign market? Exponentially so. The best piece of advice I can give you is not to do it alone. When you start looking across the pond for further expansion possibilities, and I sincerely hope that you do, make sure you choose the right partners to do it with. My good friends at WPIC Marketing and Technologies have almost 20 years of experience helping brands just like yours enter China. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The Negotiation, and if you're interested in being a guest or want to connect with me or any of our team, please reach out to us at podcast at wpic.co. 
And be sure to rate, comment, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Zai Jing.